Hi everybody, I'm Kate Wakelin. I'm from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. I'm sure most of you know who I am and thanks to everybody who's been joining us for our Facebook live sessions on Fridays. Um, it's been really lovely to get some feedback that um, that's been helpful for you so we'll keep doing them as long as you find them helpful. Um, so, and I can see Kim you've joined us so I can, at least I know it's working which is a really great start. So, um, look I, I'm not going to dwell too much on the coronavirus situation from this week because actually it's been blissfully quiet. So, you know, the good news is that we keep um, flattening that curve um, and uh, you know we can see some restrictions starting to ease um, in some states which is really great I know that people have been feeling very isolated locked down in their homes and I think particularly for people who are on their own um, this has been especially hard and I've got one friend who's single she lives on her own and she said it's six weeks since I've had a hug and I just thought yeah it's it's really tough um, it's also tough for people who are locked down with lots of people in their house, but I think the challenges are, you know, they're different across the board, but they're challenging um, nonetheless. So I just have a couple of things on my list to talk about today. I did put it out there this morning in the Facebook group and got some really great ideas. I don't think I'm going to be able to talk about all of the things you asked about this morning, but it does give me a little bit of a, an ideas bank for the future. I did have something I was thinking about talking about um, and, but I think I'll actually take that, I'll, you know, I'll do that at another stage um, because there were some really good ideas from the conversation this morning um, to chat about. So anyway, the first thing I wanted to talk about was this idea of who your oncologist is or sort of, you know, one, you know, those of you who know me well know I love a good metaphor and I think the metaphor that I like in this situation is who's driving the bus. Um, you know, if you can think about your care and your treatment and your overall management as being a bit like a bus, um, and we really want someone to be in that driver's seat. And I think there was a question this morning about um, who is the best person to be driving the bus, like what sort of specialist that would be, but also knowing that we've got a lot of people in rural areas. And actually, I was just looking at some data about that this morning. Um, and over 40% of the people who contact me via the net nurse line live more than an hour from their local, you know, capital city, um, which probably for a lot of people doesn't feel that local. And so um, there's also this, this dynamic for people where you live a long way away from where a net multidisciplinary team might be and who's driving the bus in that situation. So firstly, I wanted to talk about um, the sort of specialist that might be driving that bus. For some of you where you've had a neuroendocrine tumour removed and there's no evidence of any tumours anywhere else, and that's, a, I guess, a relatively um, uncommon situation in our group, but we do have people in our group who that's exactly their, their, their reality. Um, for, for you, sometimes that follow-up will actually be coordinated via a surgeon who took out that original tumour. Um, I guess the, the proviso with that is that it needs to be a surgeon who really knows what nets are and um, knows about and, and hopefully will have consulted with a multidisciplinary team about the ideal length of follow-up in that situation because a lot of nets we know grow very, very slowly. In fact, I was listening to one oncologist who was talking about this exact scenario where a person who had a tumour removed, PET scan was completely clear. Um, I can't remember if they had any lymph nodes, but they were talking about how long to do scans for um, and when even to start them. And her comment, and I don't think this is something that's in the literature, but her comment was, well, maybe we don't even need to start scanning for another five years because this was a very, very low grade tumour. But then we need to be looking in five, 10, 15, 20 years hence. Um, you know, one of the patients who really sticks in my mind had his tumour removed when he was 30. At that stage, they never in, even invented PET scans. So, you know, they just told him, as most people with NETS were told back then, that, oh, it's benign. You don't even need to worry about it. And 30 years later, when he was 60, he started getting carcinoid syndrome symptoms. He was getting flushing, a bit of chest wheezing, um, diarrhea. And he was like, oh, I'm going through male menopause. And went off to his GP. And after a vast variety of tests, 
they actually discovered that he had some nets growing in his liver that had taken 30 years to get to the point where they were causing him symptoms. The good news for this man um, is that, you know, that was seven years ago that his metastases were diagnosed. He's been very well controlled on um, somatostatin analogue injections. So um, his tumours are stable uh, since then, since his, certainly since his diagnosis, but certainly since the recurrence, he's been around the world a few times, seen his grandchildren, um, you know, grow up, you know, so he's actually feeling um, really confident about the future and for him with a really slow growing case of nets he's expecting that he'll stay well and maybe something else will catch him um, catch up with him at some point um, so for someone who's had a neuroendocrine tumor removed and we don't have any evidence of disease perhaps it'll be your surgeon who will direct that care um, and organize things like your follow-up scans but the, I think the proviso would be that we would want them to be checking in with a multidisciplinary team or be very experienced and active in the, in the net space in terms of how long and how frequently we want those scans to be um, taking place and also what sort of scans to be doing because that depends on the sort of tumour that you've had as to what scan to do. For some people who have relatively uncommon neuroendocrine tumours called pheochromocytomas or paragangliomas that consultant may be actually an endocrinologist. Um, and endocrinologists have a special role within the NET multidisciplinary team. They can certainly help anybody with NETs where there's a hormonal aspect to their tumour. But for these tumours, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, and I can promise you there's like a six month course in how to even say that name. Um, we call them pheos and paras for short. But for those people, an endocrinologist is often the person in the driving seat of, the, of your bus um, and they will be the person who helps direct your care and they've got particular expertise in those types of tumours. They're really weird ones. They behave differently, um, have different sorts of scans, need different sorts of treatments. So the endocrinologists are really fantastic at dealing with those. But once again, you want to be seeing an endocrinologist who is familiar with NETS, has a number of patients with NETS, can consult with a multidisciplinary team. Now for a lot of people in our Facebook group, you're people who've had NETS somewhere in your body that started and often for our patients in our support group we've got people with metastases, so NETS that have spread other places in the body. And the management of their tumours um, is, is ongoing, you know, you're living with neuroendocrine tumours and the impact of those and your treatment and your care and your follow-up will be will be ongoing. We'll take we'll keep working with you throughout the duration. Um, as I said in another Facebook Friday, Facebook Friday, the 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 person who I've had who's been living with this situation the longest was diagnosed in 1984. So this is a long-term relationship. Most marriages don't last that long. Um, sometimes your oncologist might, you know, your team might, someone in your team might um, retire and you have to employ a new one. But, um, but this is a long-term relationship and most often that would be an oncologist who would direct that care and be in that driver's seat. Um, so, but once again, you want that oncologist to know a lot about NETS because these behave differently, they're treated differently from other sorts of cancers. Um, so an oncologist who is part of a NET multidisciplinary team is your best case scenario. Or someone who can refer and can liaise easily with that multidisciplinary team is your next best option. Now if you've got NETS like my person who you know, their metastatic disease was diagnosed in 1984 and things have been very, very, very stable. Or indeed my man whose disease came back 30 years later, very, very stable since that time on the injections. People like that don't necessarily need to travel in to see someone in a multidisciplinary team every time they have a follow-up appointment. And this is especially true for those in the country. Um, because, you know, things are stable, things are going okay. And often, the role of your local oncologist will be to know when to refer in for that multidisciplinary team consultation. Um, so even in the major centres, not every person is discussed at every team meeting because they've got hundreds of patients and one team meeting every, sometimes every week, sometimes it's every month, so it varies. Um, 
But if you're in a, if you're particularly if you're rural or if things are very stable, you still want to be seeing someone who um, is willing to educate themselves about your type of tumor and have like a have a pathway for that referral into the multidisciplinary team, so that that doctor very clearly can articulate to you, well, if it grows we do another scan and if we do another scan and it's still looking to, you know more active then we refer you into the multidisciplinary team or something like that and I guess regardless of the level of, of your oncologist or your endocrinologist or your surgeon I think you know one of the most important things is that they can communicate with you and you can understand what they're saying to you that it's really clear to you what your plan is what will happen if things stay stable, what will happen if things start to grow or worsen. Um, you know, one high blood test doesn't make things an urgent review. Um, one scan that looks a little bit more active might not necessarily be the prompt for immediate referral. It might be that there's another scan hot on the heels to keep an eye and make sure it wasn't just a temporary change. So, um, but you want your oncologist or your endocrinologist or your surgeon to be really communicating very clearly about you, uh, sorry, with you about your plan and what the next step is going to be if it's not looking so flash next time they check in. So I think that's really key. The other thing that I would just say is that Actually, I think work, things work really well when you're in the driver's seat of your bus um, and then you've got a whole heap of team members. You've got a whole heap of people who you're working with along the way. One of those people will be your oncologist or your endocrinologist or your surgeon. But you've also got other people in your team. You've got a dietitian, you've got maybe a nurse, you've got maybe the new, your neuroendocrine cancer Australia nurse. You've got people in this Facebook support group who are all part of your team, but also your family, your friends. Um, you've got tools in, in, the, in the toolbox of your bus. So some of those tools are things like somatostatin analog injections and medications and things like that. Another tool will be your diet. Another tool will be exercise. Another tool for you might be engaging in regular meditation or relaxation to help look after this part of your body, which is just as important as the rest of you. Um, so you'll have tools in your toolkit. You'll have people who are on the team who are taking that bus forward. But actually, you know, I think people who've been leaving nets a long time get very good at knowing where the bumps in the road might be and where there's a diversion in the map and you know they've traveled that they've they've driven along that road before and they know that well that path goes down to prrt we might need to take that turn off at some point so i'm so sorry about all my constant metaphors um but i'm a bit of a metaphor fan and i think you know if that's a helpful way of um visualizing the way that your disease is managed and the way that you can help manage your disease then that's great as always, I'm really happy to talk with anybody who's got some questions or concerns about whether they think the person who's in the driver's seat of their bus really knows where they're going. Um, and, and we can help sort of sort through that um, together. The other thing that came up in the conversation on Facebook this morning when I put it out there and said, well, you know, what would you like me to talk about? was carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis. So I know in our exercise physiology video a couple of weeks ago, we talked about carcinoid crisis and exercise. And I guess there's that very um, very remote possibility that for some people with really kind of a very fragile balance in their carcinoid syndrome and their hormones, that exercise might trigger some symptoms. So we did talk about it then and I did flash up the um, medical alert card so um i don't know if you can see oh gee there you go there's the camera and you can see that card and a few people have actually got in touch with us and asked us to send some out so they will be um via australia post getting to you um so but carcinoid syndrome i think is the is at the root of this and that's something that i didn't explain in that video because you know that wasn't the focus of what we were talking about that day so carcinoid syndrome is when the body is producing, or well, the tumours are producing too much, usually of the hormone um, serotonin, and a lot of gut tumours produce too much of that particular hormone. Um, that gives people a number of symptoms, and um, we call that classic carcinoid syndrome 
um, symptoms and it's things like flushing, it's things like diarrhea, sometimes people can get some nausea or abdominal pain, sometimes people can feel a bit short of breath and wheezy as well, sometimes anxiety is part of the picture. So diarrhea, flushing and then a whole heap of other things along the way. That's usually telling us that your tumours are producing too much serotonin, makes you feel really unwell. And the primary treatment for carcinoid syndrome is the somatostatin analogue injection. So that's sandostatin la or lanreotide. It's the big butt harpoons that everybody hates every month. But for most people that controls their symptoms really well. There's another drug, oh, I wasn't going to talk about this, but now I've gone there, so I'm going to go there and we might be five minutes longer. Um, there's another drug that also helps with some aspects of carcinoid syndrome. Instead of, so sandostatin la and lanreotide work by stopping the tumour from being able to squirt out as much hormone. And that does that because it's blocking receptors on the surface of the tumour and sort of fooling the tumour into going to sleep, essentially. There's another drug, it's called telotrostat, um, and the other name is Zamello, so telotrostat. And it, again, there was a six month course in how to say that drug properly, um, the name of that drug properly, but Zamello is an easier way of saying it. That works in a really different way. So it actually stops the body being able to supply as much serotonin. So it actually reduces the amount of serotonin available to tumors to be able to produce. So it, um, it interestingly doesn't make any difference to the growth rate of tumours, it doesn't slow tumour growth rate down in the same way that these injections do, but it does help with one particular aspect of carcinoid syndrome which is diarrhoea. So for some people who are on the monthly butt jabs but still getting a lot of diarrhoea, telotrostat can be a really useful um, addition to their therapy. A couple of things to tell you about prescribing of telotrostat. The first thing is that it has been approved by the FDA in Australia, the, um, oh sorry, the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Alliance. So it's been approved for use of un uh, for people with poorly controlled carcinoid syndrome and particularly diarrhea who are on the monthly butt harpoons. Um, the important thing about it is that the prescription benefit scheme has not yet taken this on board uh, and it's not funded. So if you were to go um, with a prescription, a normal prescription to your pharmacy and take that for um, the supply of telotrostat, it costs, I don't know how much it costs actually, but lots of money because it's not covered by the prescription benefit scheme. Now because of that, the drug company who make the drug have um, a compassionate access scheme. Now there are some limitations to this. So um, it's important to talk with and with anything, as I always say, please talk to your doctor about any of this. But um, they are, oncologists are actually able to refer for that compassionate access scheme so that patients who have that diarrhea can give it a go and see actually if that helps their diarrhea alongside the somatostatin analog injections. So slight diversion onto the telotrostat. I'm sorry, I just, you know, had to go there. Um, so, but carcinoid syndrome, Usually the primary source of man way to manage that is the monthly injections. Now for some people, as we've kind of already talked about, they do get breakthrough symptoms. They still get some carcinoid syndrome despite having that injection every 28 days. There's a number of things that um, a doctors are trialing and this is actually being currently researched. So the evidence is, um, is still really emerging about what is the best thing to do in that situation. Um, uh, because we know it's actually not good for your body to have those symptoms apart from being unpleasant. It actually is bad for the heart, it's bad for the connective tissue in your gut um, and it's bad for your vitamin and minerals, so for your nutrition. So we want to have those symptoms well under control. The first thing that can be done and we talked about in the Facebook this in the Facebook group this morning is you, there is a short acting version of the same, essentially the same drug that's in those two monthly injections. It's called octreotide, and actually that's a, that'll be a familiar word um, because that's also the infusion that we give for carcinoid crisis, which I'm going to come to in a minute. But octreotide, the long-acting version of octreotide is either sandostatin la or lanreotide, but there's a short-acting that only lasts a couple of hours, really. Um, it's a small injection and it goes into the tummy, so it's a bit more like having an injection of insulin for someone with diabetes 
So sometimes people are talking about short acting in the group and someone will go, oh my goodness, you're injecting that yourself? And it's like, well, no, it's actually just a really small injection that goes under the skin in the tummy. Um, and some doctors will prescribe that as a bit of a breakthrough um, so that if you're getting some carcinoid syndrome in between your injections, that can be a useful way of managing those symptoms. Um, uh, the other thing that some oncologists are doing, and again, we're doing some, there's some research in this area. I was hoping to get an update for this um, at ENETS in Barcelona, which none of us got to, but, um, but there is ongoing research about this, and that is bringing the frequency of those butt jab in injections closer together. So some doctors are prescribing them every three weeks rather than every four. It's, we're still the jury's out as to whether that's a useful thing you know in big groups of people although some people tell me that that's actually really helped so that's again one thing that you can talk to your doctor about if you're getting carcinoid syndrome symptoms and you're already on the maximum dose of monthly injections some people you know they're having so much that they're having one jab in each butt cheek which is always you know in for a penny in for a pound why not balance up the equation and go both sides i don't sound that great but anyway it's better than carcinoid syndrome for most people i think and um but but also there's those other measures of um the injection being given more frequently but also using some short acting and also the telotrostat if it's just diarrhea that's actually the really the problem that might actually be something that you can look at as well so what's the difference between carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis Good question posed by David this morning um, in our Facebook group. Um, really, it's more like a continuum. So at one end is carcinoid syndrome and at the other end is carcinoid crisis. And so carcinoid crisis is just like a really ramped up version of carcinoid syndrome where people can get very ill. Um, often it will affect the blood pressure so you can get a drop in blood pressure which can leave you really dizzy, lightheaded, awful flushing, nausea, sometimes vomiting, diarrhea, um, and, it, and it can actually be very life-threatening if it's severe. Fortunately, it's really rare, and, and exercise-related carcinoid syndrome is not even something that I've really seen written about in the literature, so we can exercise with a fair amount of, core, uh, a fair amount of confidence in that regard, but there's some other things that can stimulate um, carcinoid crisis. One of the things that people um, get particularly worried about and with you know with reasonable cause is that an injection of dre an adrenaline can for some people where they get really nasty carcinoid syndrome that might stimulate a carcinoid crisis so I've had sometimes people who have had dental work it's very rare but dental work where they inject adrenaline as well as a local anesthetic sometimes that can give people a real rush of hormone in very rare cases that can lead to carcinoid crisis. Um, sometimes a general anaesthetic and operations on other parts of the body, once again, probably where they're giving you a fair amount of adrenaline. So adrenaline's used in surgery to reduce the blood flow to the area they're operating on and it stops bleeding during the operation. So sometimes if you're having a knee arthroscopy or something like that, they'll give you a fair amount of adrenaline into the joint where they're operating on and that can lead to carcinoid crisis. So I've had a few people who've kind of woken up from the intent from the um, anesthetic and there's you know they're surrounded by a group of people who are all peering up down at them looking very concerned because they dropped their blood pressure and needed some help pretty fast. Um, the other thing that can stimulate carcinoid crisis is actually when doctors are doing an operation and they're handling the tumour or even in really really rare situations I've had one or two patients where even the doctors palpating like examining the tummy and pressing on areas of tumour has actually stimulated a rush of hormone so if you're having an operation on tumours it's it's best if that's done by a surgeon who's really experienced in dealing with these sorts of tumours but not only that you need your anaesthetist to know about this as well and the the the, the way we manage it is with octreotide. So it's the same as the short-acting octreotide that I was just talking about before. And for you guys, you can self-inject that in the skin um, on the tummy. Um, but it can also be given in an, in an IV, in an intravenous infusion. So um, if you're having an operation, often an anaesthetist will give you a little bit in your drip while you're asleep. And that'll just ward off, you know, help control that carcinoid syndrome so you don't get carcinoid crisis. So 
I did talk about this carcinoid crisis card and this has got the references and the dosage range for the octreotides that your anaesthetist or you know someone would need the doctor would need to give you if you were to experience carcinoid crisis so not everybody with nets gets carcinoid syndrome and only a very small percentage of people with carcinoid syndrome would ever be at risk of a carcinoid crisis so it's really rare but it is scary because it can be life-threatening so we do have those cards but you don't need not everybody with nets needs to have one it's really if you get quite significant carcinoid syndrome so the flushing the diarrhea especially on the if you're on the monthly butt jabs and you're still getting lots of it it's definitely worth carrying one of these cards around with you now the other the other card that I haven't really talked about in Facebook Friday is also about carcinoid syndrome and this is I like to very politely call it our bathroom card although sometimes people call it the toilet card and this says the holder of this card has a medical condition and needs to use toilet facilities urgently um, I think especially at the moment with um, public toilets being locked down in a lot of states this is becoming more of a concern for people if you get diarrhea and you need to use a loo urgently that can be really really um, difficult like you know often the oh look I'm always doing this at lunchtime aren't I but often what you need to go to the toilet for is pretty liquid um, and most people you know anyone who's had a couple of babies or you know anyone over the age of 50 like your pelvic floor might not be so flush it's sort of it can get really messy and really embarrassing really fast um, and actually incontinence is something that a lot of people with carcinoid syndrome struggle with really silently so that might be another Facebook Friday topic for another day um, with due warning for anyone who's eating their lunch but um, I actually interestingly someone in our Facebook group did get refused the use of a, of a, of a loo um, at, a, at a shop um, and I, I do believe that their partner went back and tore shreds out of the out of the shop assistant um, later on but yeah look mostly we've had no problem with people having permission to use like the staff toilet or you know the toilet that they keep out the back for emergencies um, which can really get you out of a tight spot nice and fast so actually anyone who gets carcinoid syndrome I would recommend that you have one of these cards so there's two ways you can two ways you can get the cards the first way is via our website you can download and print them um, and if you've got a laminator machine or you've got some hard you know some um, a good quality sort of thick stock card that you can use you can carry that in your wallet a lot of people like the plastic version because it just feels a little bit more legitimate it feels a bit less like you've just dummied something up on PowerPoint and printed it out just to be convenient because you know we've all got lots of time on our hands to do things like that but I don't know anyone who would carry something like this around just to be lazy but anyway um, we can also send them out free of charge to you uh, just let us know and the email address I'll put this in the notes as well but it's volunteers at neuroendocrine.org.au and that'll give you all a bit of practice on how to spell neuroendocrine because we know that's just such a pleasure for everyone to print out but volunteers at neuroendocrine.org.au and that means that email will go through to our volunteer team who do all of the packaging and sending for our of um, resources for us the other thing I've just two things I mentioned about carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis and then I better stop um, <laughs> our booklet that way is the cover so um, neuroendocrine tumors a guide for patients there's really good information about carcinoid syndrome on this booklet it's on page 20 if you've got a previous version it might be on a different page um, and also carcinoid crisis on page 21 something I will talk about on another Facebook Friday is carcinoid heart disease that's also on page 21 if you want to do the pre-reading on that one um, that's a, a really good page to put a little bookmark in um, to have a to have a read of um, and to be able to refer back so let me just search my brain and think of oh yeah just a couple of other things really kind of little housekeeping things the first thing is um, Megan our media and comms manager has just popped up something on the Facebook group just now um, we've been redoing all of our resources you'll notice you know everything's still got unicorn foundation all over it including my brain um, <laughs> but we are as we run out of things we will be producing new versions with neuroendocrine cancer Australia but you'll be pleased to know we're not you know printing stuff and throwing things away we're going to be sending out all of the previously branded stuff and then as new stuff um, needs to be printed then we'll be doing the update 
a brochure um, and I should probably show you a copy of the brochure but I haven't got it right at hand but our brochure um, was in need of updating anyway and we've only got about 20 left so it's time to work on that um, and we had some ideas in our team about the best look and feel of that brochure and then we gave it to our consumer advisory group and they told us something actually quite different which was really interesting the thing that strikes us about that is that um, a the unit of neuroendocrine cancer Australia team we're all female and actually all but one of our consumer advisory group are female as well so that's probably a balance that we need to redress at some point but we're really keen to get some blokes input on this because I know from previous work that I've done what males want to pick up and read from a literature stand in a in hospital or a doctor's surgery might be quite different to what women will want to look at so um, I'd really love you to hop in and just it's a very very quick vote um, it's worth if you've got a color printer and you've got five minutes to spare printing them out and having a look at what they look like on the piece of paper um, that'd be handy if you could vote for us and just tell us what you think so we know what to print so you know obviously we want that brochure to look visible for people who are walking through an oncology department and might have a neuroendocrine tumor but might not have heard of us so that they can be linked in with all of the support and all of the information the research the resources everything so the other thing I will just um, mention is Let's Walk for Nets, which continues to be like a shining beacon of joy in my life. Um, it's certainly been really motivating for my husband, which um, he's in the next room because we're all working from home these days. But can I just say, couch potato, seriously, he's, he's one of those computer nerds who doesn't really do a lot of activity and he has been out there doing steps because I've kind of conned him into joining my team for let's walk for nets so I know um, from looking at the Facebook group a couple of things that have brought lots of joy the first thing is the beautiful photographs that people are posting of beaches and sunsets and nature um, and it just makes me very grateful to live in Australia where we have such beautiful scenery and landscapes to be looking at um, you know as from a walk from home for many of us um, the other thing that I'm really loving seeing is people celebrating the small wins so for some of you we know and I've said this before um, but you know walking to the letterbox is a is a major exercise and so that's great um, for other people it's been you know walking 5 10 k's fantastic let's celebrate what everybody's able to do and I guess over the over the course of this number of weeks that we're doing the challenge I'm looking forward to seeing what changes people might have noticed in their way their bodies are working and maybe the way they can tolerate um, their exercises. So thank you so much everybody for engaging with that. I just wanted to give you a quick update. 182 people are part of the challenge. Um, we've walked over 20,000 kilometers. Yeah, 20,000 kilometers. Amazing. Like the whole way around Australia. And, you know, having done a few half marathons on every kilometer. Whew, it's hard work so that's just oh, so extraordinary and we're so thrilled um, uh, it's not too late to join so I'll stick a link um, underneath it's not a competition it's just a way of I guess us all sort of helping to self motivate to get get moving get out of the house be exercising if we can and I think you know the research is really clear that especially for people with cancer doing some exercise just stretching your body a little bit is really beneficial um, in terms of your general health but also you know in terms of cancer outcomes so we're really keen to encourage that and we're so happy to see you know the way that you've all embraced that so I'm gonna have a very quick look at the comments um, oh no I'm not because it's not gonna show oh, here we go just to make sure there's not any other little questions um, and ah. Oh, does anybody else here have pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma? Ah, fantastic. Um, James wrote that in the comments. Really good reminder. There is a specific group for people with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas in Australia and New Zealand. It's a brilliant group because I have learned so much about those particular very rare types of tumours. wasn't something that I had come across very much in my nursing practice um, prior to coming to Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. So I have learned so much from these people. These people are guns at, you know, they just know 
so much and there's really great information in that group about the endocrinologists that they all recommend they'll talk a lot about their own situation a lot of these particular types of humors are hereditary as well so there's a lot of conversation about family and um, testing and, and all of those genetic testing and all of those sorts of things that if you are in this group watching this feed and you have a FIO or a para I'll pop the link to the FIO and para support group on in the comments because it, seriously it's a really wonderful group we don't run it so it's not a neuroendocrine cancer um, run group um, the members of that group have really kindly allowed me to observe the conversations because I just learn so much and I love to be able to refer people into that group. So if, again, once again, if you've got a FIO or a para um, and you're interested in that group, I'll put, the, um, I'll put the link in the comments. Let me just see if there's any other particular questions. Yeah, love the Let's Walk for Nets challenge, me too. Um, look, there's so many ideas I've got for what to cover in Facebook Friday. So I think probably you're stuck with me on Fridays for at least the time being. Um, but I would love to hear your feedback if there's comments, if there's thoughts about other things that you'd like me to um, cover. Oh, so glad I hadn't turned the thing off because there was a really important thing I forgot to mention, which is Dr. John Layden, who's the co one of the co-founders of Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. He's an anaesthetist in Sydney really handy to have as part of our network and as part of our, our board. Um, John did a webinar on carcinoid crisis, well actually on anaesthetics and nets, but he covered carcinoid crisis in a lot of detail in this webinar. I'll put a link to it in the comments. It's also on our website which is all the w's dot neuroendocrine.org.au. Um, it's also on our YouTube channel, which I'll pop the link to the YouTube channel in the comments too. So I've got some homework. I hope I remember it all. Um, look, I hope you all have a fantastic week. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to talk with you on Fridays and, and just, you know, touch base and see how you're all travelling. Um, don't hesitate to give me a call. It's been a little, well, up until Wednesday afternoon, it had been a little bit quieter. I've still got a few messages from Wednesday that I'm calling people back from today. So if you are expecting to hear from me and I haven't yet, then I'll be in touch this afternoon. But um, yeah, look, don't hesitate to give me a call or send me an email. Private messages on Facebook, you've all been really fantastic at just staying off the private messages. Um, it just it's all a bit too much for my little brain to manage. And also there's just the health privacy stuff that we don't want to get wrapped into. So if you've got a question for me, email's great. So netnurse at neuroendocrine.org.au or, um, or the, the phone line. Um, uh, well, gee, next time I will definitely remember to have the phone on me like the phone number on me so I can tell you without being scared of um, misquoting it but I will put it in the comments so look have a great week everybody I hope you stay well hope you stay warm if you're in the southern states because it's freezing here in Melbourne and um, yeah I look forward to seeing you next Friday take care and... oh, I'm gonna work this out one day